Welcome to Coast to Coast AM's YouTube channel. I'm George Norrie. Like, share, and subscribe. Also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and coasttocoastam.com. Become a Coast Insider for ad-free access to thousands of shows you'll really enjoy. Werewolves, dire dogs, chupacabras. You know, for many, these creatures are works of fiction, the products of misconception and overactive imaginations. But if these stories are indeed myths, then why are so many of these details so similar? And why do so many of these witnesses repeat the same thing over and over again? I know what I saw. That's the name of the latest book by Linda Godfrey, and she's next on Coast to Coast AM. I know what I saw, modern day encounters with monsters of new urban legend and ancient lore. Welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. Linda Godfrey with us, one of the most respected authorities on anomalous animals and paranormal phenomena all over the country, specifically Wisconsin. She has investigated wolfmen, Bigfoot, and other strange creatures for more than 25 years. She's had a number of her own field encounters, and as a journalist, she was the first to break the story of a terrifying werewolf-like monstrosity lurking in the shadow-shrouded forests around Elkhorn, Wisconsin's Bray Road. I remember that story well. Welcome back, Linda Godfrey. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be back. How have you been? Very well, thank you. A little busy. Um, This book took me a good three years, including all the publisher's time, you know, that they need to work their magic upon it. So, um, it's yeah, it's it's feeling really good to have it out there. The actual release date is tomorrow. Actually, it's today, now that I think about it. Yeah, so um, it's... Perfect great. timing. <laughs> exactly. Hey, before we get into it, The Beast of Bray Road, do you give everybody a little highlight about that? Because that was one of our first times we had you on, and uh, what a great story. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's what really catapulted me, although it was a slow catapult at first, it took a while, um, in, into this rendezvous with um, cryptozoology as, that I've had my, my uh, last, gee, 27 years I think it's been. So it was 91, 92 when I had a, a job at the local, uh, the local newspaper, and they offered me the job of reporter. I was doing cartoons for them and, and artwork. And my very first week into the job, somebody said, hey, did you hear that people out on Bray Road, which is a three- to four-mile-long stretch just east of Elkhorn, Wisconsin, did you hear that out there they're saying there's something like a werewolf? And I laughed. I, you know, I thought, what joke is this? They're trying to get the new reporter. Ha ha. And as I asked around town, I found out, no, there, there really were people who were saying there was a werewolf on Bray Road. And I happened to um, drop in on the county animal control officer about another interesting thing, which was that we were having uh, mutilated dogs found. Jeez. <laughs> and uh, some other strange things like that. And I said to you, have you heard about this thing, people saying they saw out on Bray Road that looks like a werewolf? And he said, oh, you mean this? And he opened up his file drawer and pulled out a manila folder marked werewolf, which... Um, <laughs> he he know, was on had, top of this one, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he really was. People have been calling him and saying, I saw this thing. I know, I don't know what it is. But if there were such a thing as werewolf, that's what I saw. It was standing, you know, it was between five and seven feet tall, covered with dark, shaggy hair, um, pointy ears on top of the head, a long muzzle, and walking on its uh, tiptoes is the way they usually describe people. Excuse me, the way that people usually describe these things walking. And they say its legs were bent backwards, which means they're looking at the dog's hock, which would be our heel. And it's carried up off the ground because they do walk on their toe pads. And when I went to visit the people who were saying this, I was very impressed. I hadn't expected much, but as it turned out, they were a very diverse bunch, women, children, um, older, younger, blue-collar, white-collar, several farmers, one man with a very high clearance from um, an area major um, air, air station, and I thought, they don't seem like they're lying. And furthermore, I thought, why would anyone who was just doing a, 
a hoax or trying to have some fun, leave all their contact information with the authorities because, you know, of course, if anything happened or they were charged with fraud or anything, Mm -hmm. they would know right where to go find them. People just don't usually do that. So um, we thought it would just be a short local story. I was thinking, you know, like local folklore or a campfire. And lo and behold, once the story ran with these witness um, this, uh, with these witness descriptions, um, it went, well, we can't say that it went viral back then because the Internet was not what it is now. It went national was, I think, how we put it. Um, people were just very excited about it. They began writing me longhand and typed letters that they had to look up the address to the to the uh, newspaper and, and send me and saying, I had I have seen this myself or my grandmother has seen it or somebody. It's not a joke. And ten years later, after that never stopped happening, where uh, any time that I was on a show of any kind, radio or TV, I would hear from people and they would tell me their stories. And I felt obligated to keep the lore as, as I thought of it. Um, because no one else seemed to be interested. And I decided to write a book thinking that would just stop, you know, all the uh, speculation about it. People would know what it was, and it, in turn, just fueled more. And so here uh, I've been about, I think this is book 18, on just strange people, places, and and things. And um, every time I write more about these creatures, I hear... More, from, more stories pop up, don't exactly. they? Exactly. People are just eager to let me know that um, it's happened to them, too, or they want an explanation. And so here I sit, um, you know, with, with another book. <laughs> are you convinced, Linda, with all these stories that, one, people are seeing something? Would, can we all agree on that? Oh, I think so. I do not claim to know precisely what it is, but... It, it's a thing, as they say today. It's a thing, um, we might say more specifically, it's some type of phenomenon. Um, it's not any sort of collusion. It's not, um, there's no such thing as mass hallucination. Um, it's something that is happening to people in all walks of life, usually unexpectedly. Usually the people who are actively looking for it are not the ones who normally see it. It's when your guard is down, when you're not thinking of it, when you have no idea what it is, those are the people who seem to come upon it and, and have the sightings and encounters. And the subtitle of your new book, I Know What I Saw, Modern Day Encounters with Monsters of New Urban Legend and Ancient Lore. The ancient lore really uh, excites me because something happened to uh, the people of ancient indigenous tribes Native Americans, wherever they may have been, these people saw creatures too, didn't they? They did, and we know that from their art and um, from some of the the literate ones, the uh, stories that they've engraved, I think back to the Sumerians, and they have this one uh, creature named, it was one of their gods, I believe, named Pazuzu. He was kind of a um, very difficult character, some people believe. Uh, and Pazuzu was sort of a humanoid bird form, and very much like some of the Thunderbird de- depictions of the Native Americans and and others. And why we now one of the one of the most recent flaps of any type of unknown creature has been this dozens and dozens and dozens of sightings of something that looks like a giant bird bat with sort of a a humanoid center, and they've been mostly um, over the Chicago area, surprisingly enough. And people are comparing it to to the Mothman, Um, but we say we just had that same issue, or excuse me, same same description back in Sumerian times, and then you go to the Egyptians, and they're also having all of the humanoid creatures that we refer to as monsters, things with dog heads or dog bodies. the ibis, a, a type of a bird man, uh, they all have this idea that somehow there are parts of animals, parts of men that can go together and create these unusual creatures. A lot of people have thought that some of these creatures could be dimensional. 
I've ruled that out, Linda. How about you? Um, you mean coming from another dimension, or yeah, that they're coming through portals and things like that. Well, I would I would not say that I I ruled it out, but um, maybe there's just a better way of putting putting it that they're not. I, I don't believe that they're extraterrestrials from another planet. Myself, that just doesn't seem to have enough enough evidence. But um, there's a, there's a way of describing it that many of my Native American friends I've talked to in different tribes. They're not all exactly the same, of course. They have um, they each has their own unique culture, but um, most of the time it goes something like they believe that particularly. The upright canines and the Bigfoot and these um, big spirit birds, and now lately I've been hearing from them the, the black panther-like creatures also. Um, they say these are originally spirit beings, and that they can come to this um, place where we are, the, the earthly, the earthly um, place, in order to procreate. Um, Eat, have they? They can. They have all kinds of things to show us that they do have solidity. They they leave tracks and footprints. Um, they can certainly leave claw marks or bashes in people's cars, especially some of these larger canine types. And so we we know that they're not just ghostly type things. But on the other hand, there are altogether too many incidents where people um, have somehow emptied an, a, a clip. Of ammunition into one, or done, hit it with a car, or whatever, where nothing happens to the creature. They kind of, you know, redouble and then straighten themselves off and hurry off into the woods. It's not like you would expect, though, with a normal a normal earth creature. If it's like a, I'm thinking of a bear, you know, especially a grizzly bear or mm-hmm. a big cougar. If if they want to see you as prey and they see you as any sort of a menace to their territory or their offspring, um, they'll, they'll come after you. You know, we have, we have that happen um, all the time, not, not super frequently, but every year you hear bear reports or whatever. These other things don't do that. In 27 years, I've only had one person tell me that they actually had bodily harm or physical hurt from it. This was a man who was on a, a hiking path at a, in a national forest up in quebec um he was just out for a lark he didn't have he he didn't have a gun or anything like that with him and he ran almost literally face to face with an upright wolf-like creature and and it didn't this in this case this thing what attacked him or defended what what happened well they came face to face and he said he's he's just in shock and his instinct is to just kind of move forward to to the right and unfortunately he said it was kind of like it felt sort of like in a supermarket where you're coming down the market the market with with your cart and somebody else is coming you kind of go <laughs> neither one knows which way to turn and he said it seemed to be like trying to rush past him and he sort of jumped a little bit the wrong way and it ended up grazing him with its its, its mouth had been open you know and its fangs were showing and it grazed him with its fangs, kind of tore his shirt and left a, a gash in his side. He sent me a photograph of the healed up. Um, but it could have chomped down on him if it wanted to, I bet. He said, you know, if it had wanted to get me, it would have just taken It would have right torn there. him apart, yeah. Yeah, and instead it just, you know, ran for the hills. And that's almost always what happens whenever anybody gets close to one of these things. They act like they want to pursue it. They act like they want it. For, they'll say, I, I thought I was lunch, you know, but then it doesn't happen. It just um, runs off. What do you think these creatures are, Linda? <laughs> well, um, they seem to be creatures that can span different energy levels, um, you know, and it, it gets into some kind of... Um, well, and, and years. They must be breeding because... Right. What they saw during the ancient days can't be the same creature we're seeing today. Uh, it's got to be the offspring of them. Well, exactly. Yeah, there's there's new procreation of one type or another going on here. It's not like there's been 
just you know w- one creature one one of each type of creature since uh way way back in ancient days they there are definitely many um reports where people will say i there was one with a smaller one you know that I thought was probably an offspring of some type there's I had one very credible report from a man um who saw this was in the land uh the land between the lakes between uh kentucky and and Tennessee where he saw what he took for a female upright canine with three smaller ones about the same size, all walking on their hind legs, all crossing the road in front of him as he was leaving his campground. So um, they, seem to, they seem to procreate when they're here. And um, some of my Native American friends think that perhaps is their main reason. And it's, it's almost as if they want to mimic a powerful animal in order to um, go about their business, whatever that is. Though you don't think they're extraterrestrial per se, might they have been dumped here years ago from extraterrestrials? Uh, I I would say, you know, knowing what we know about extraterrestrials and the way that um, the UFOs seem to interact with with humans and with other things, with, with animals too, and since there have been sightings where um, it appears that some sort of large unknown creature has just debarked from one of these UFOs. Um, it's possible, you know. It's I always feel it, it, it's not up to me to put limits on the universe and how these things can work. But I do try to just observe and see what things um, seem logical in, in light of the other things that are known, and then give it my best guess. How many urban legends are out there, Linda, that are really? the the real deal um yeah and that's a good question because there are things that aren't necessarily what they look like you know and and actually um this the latest flap of bat-like creatures over and around chicago is one that i sincerely have my doubts on because it doesn't follow the uh sort of description well it follows the description in in being a large a large bat-like creature, although with these things, they never show up next to something so you can tell how big they are. In other large bird and large um, flying bat incidents that I've investigated, uh, they aren't afraid to be on the road or next to your car. Um, it's usually out of the city. And these ones by Chicago, these things are showing up over the Art Institute and over the, you know, the, the fancy downtown areas and uh, certain neighborhoods. They're, they're not out in the liminal or or um, sideline places where these things are usually found. And I have a theory that they're probably, or at least very likely, some type of performance art because there happens to be a well-known professor from the school, from the Art Institute, uh, where my own son went to school, mm-hmm. who did um, kind of like almost living art, living dioramas with mechanical bats that he would take and have sort of a bat cage exhibit with real bats and then these large mechanical bats that he equipped with some sort of sonar emitting uh, just the way that they have the, their echolocation. That was on them in a, in a uh, modified way. And um, also he, their, their wings would flap. They could be remote controlled. And that he started doing those, I think, around 10 years ago. Well, since then, the drones have become really affordable and widespread. Sure. And if he could figure out a way to attach a drone to that, he could send here. Maybe not him necessarily. Maybe some students who knew of his work. Um, there are other art schools downtown there, too. So it could have been anyone, really. Uh, I did write to him and never received a response because it just seemed so, famil- so familiar, so similar to his work. Um, he's also the one that, he, and he also has done things with animals in the past. He was famous for supposedly um, creating a hybrid rabbit with with some sort of jellyfish to make it glow like a green color when it was under ultraviolet light. And that story has been somewhat debunked too. Linda, first explain what Slenderman is or stick people, uh, and have other cultures seen this thing? Yes, they have actually, but um, it's been a while. It, it's something that feels sort of new, and these um, stick stick people, Slenderman type things, they look physically similar. They're 
tall, very, very thin, like really too thin to be human is how people des describe it. They often are wearing hats, in which case they're called hat men. Sometimes you don't see any features on them at all. They're just uh, black, almost like shadows, and then they're called shadow people. So there are different variations of it. Um, but the Slender Man is one that became popular um, around the early 2010s um, through this new type of website called Creepypasta. And Creepypasta was sort of um, borrowed from the old copy and paste um, instructions of the early uh, computers where you, before you had to laboriously type things and then all of a sudden with computers you could just copy them mm -hmm. somewhere else. Paste and it and off you go. Exactly, exactly. And so that gave kind of a jump start to many um, literary sites where they had lots of people kind of having fun um, putting out um, a, a starting legend and then everybody would write their own next incidents or endings to it. And they became kind of these uh, sort of interesting, large communities for people to use on the Internet. Well, one very popular uh, area was horror. And if you started um, searching for things, you could find names like The Rake, Wendigo, um, Goatman, Michigan Dogman, Melonhead, um, and the Six-Legged Centaur was one of my favorites. Slender Man was kind of an eerie one. This idea of these tall, slender things has been around for a while and in, and in many cultures. Um, there are Native Americans that have these thick people figures. They're somewhat related to deer people, things that people see running on their hind legs down roads. They're tall. They've got very skinny legs like deer. Um, sometimes they'll have hooves even or, or horns. And um, they're considered very much like the water horses of Scotland in some places by, by some of the Native American tribal people because they can shape shift and lure people. They'll see this beautiful looking woman. They don't notice that she's got hooves. And they uh, go somewhere with her and then end up uh, having terrible things happen. So they're very um, nervous if they see a very lovely woman running along the road at night trying to signal to, to stop and, and pick her up. And, um, and maybe some of that has to do also, it, it's, it's easier to have that sort of thing going on where you've got automobiles, things that are going fast and can take you places and where you might feel obligated to pick someone up and, and give them a ride. Has Slenderman been known, Linda, to try to hurt people directly? Um, I don't believe that there are sightings of something that looks exactly like Slenderman. Um, or the shadow people where they where people have felt directly hurt. I think uh, particularly with the shadow, the shadow people are something that are much more widespread and better known. I think they've been around longer than our automobile computer age um, creatures or monsters have. And I don't know that it's actually, um, you know, kind of like the, the upright canines. They seem very, uh, some people will say they seem demonic even, and yet, I, I don't have the records and I haven't seen the stories of them actually injuring human beings or even um, animals. That's an interesting take. But nowadays with uh, social networking, isn't Slender Man almost the, like a fad thing? Yeah, it, it became really um, very much a fad in the social network. And, and again, the center of these stories were... Something about it just appealed to these young people who were writing uh, stories. Maybe it, it is just so scary to think of this really stretched out thin person that doesn't look like it could be human, and yet there it is, you know, on the roadside or following you or, or wherever. And um, although I have to add, I really personally don't have lots of sightings of the Slender Man, if, if any, myself. A few people I've heard have had uh, reports on it, but generally when there are reports, it's more like the hat man or the shadow people. And that also gets into uh, the same sort of thing with animals. For instance, I have had and have been getting increasing numbers of reports of something called the shadow wolf. The shadow wolf? Shadow wolf. And these are from people uh, hmm. 
in very diverse places. They haven't heard of one another. It's not something that I've written a lot about, um, although I've, I've started to. But I know of one place on the edge of a national for or a state forest in Wisconsin where I've had three separate people write about they're driving along, and they see this kind of dark thing. It's either alongside the road, in some woods near the road, um, somewhere where they can just see it, and it has a wolf-like shape, but it's just this dead black color. And they can see eyes. Usually it has a glowing red eye. Sometimes you see the teeth. And it's just huge for any type of actual dog or wolf, sometimes three or, I mean, enormously huge. And usually it just sort of melts into the shadows as, as they um, get out of range of looking at it. But um, that's kind of a new, and they'll just automatically call it, they'll say it was like a shadow wolf. Um, I had one incident, this was actually in my last book, Monsters Among Us, that happened, I believe in Tennessee, where an entire large family saw this thing. They were all outdoors doing kind of farm chores. They had like large vegetable gardens and a, um, a corn patch. And they all of a sudden looked and saw this big shadowy black wolf looking at them from the woods. And they all started kind of yelling. There were children. There was, you know, a, a parent. There was a grandmother. And this thing started just walking across their, their garden as if um, they weren't even there. And finally it turned and looked at them. And when it did that, they realized it was like something two-dimensional because when it turned, there was almost nothing there to see. And then it turned back and they could see the full side view of it again. And the grandmother, and I talked to several, I interviewed several members of this family and and they all verified what happened and what it looked like. And uh, the grandmother, who I'm not sure how old she was, grabbed some type of a farm implement and started chasing toward it, and then it just ran off somehow into the woods. Amazing. Now, what is the witchy wolf? Witchy wolf is originally, I thought it would be just sort of a legend. This thing has been known for a long time. In a place, um, it appears in a place called Omer Plains on the east side of Michigan. And about probably 20 years or so ago, um, there was a, a writer for an area publication who David Kulczyk, his his name is, who um, wrote kind of a definitive um, story about what was thought of it at that time. And at that time. Um, it was most often seen in an open area called the Omer Plains. Um, there was an, a very old cemetery near there, and it was the old uh, trope of um, teenagers sitting in, and necking in the car, and then this monster comes up to you, and everybody screams. Sometimes the boys are out of the car, and bad, thing, bad things happen. And um, they claim that the, there were um, pines all around this area, pine trees, and there would be things hear, heard screaming and whistling in the pine trees. Some people said, well, it's just what pine trees do, is they, if there's a wind, they kind of, you know, make noises when, when it runs through the fir branches. And the thing was that um, it didn't have necessarily to be windy for that to happen. So um, I looked into that a little bit more, and I was able to go to their historical society and library that they have right there on the grounds. And after inquiring, I was given some uh, um, copies of, of some reports that had been written by a former possibly town historian. They, they seemed to me that they were half, half actual accounts and half um, kind of nonsense put in there. But according to these papers, this all started back in the Civil War when um, one of the families uh, sent one of their sons off to, to uh, fight in a civil war, and he mm -hmm. came back um, with not even much of his, his remains were left there. Oh, and geez. he had died in one of the uh, um, determined camps for, or the, that where the, the captured soldiers were kept. And um, when he arrived there. The family buried him. It wasn't uh, a good time of year to do a lot to the grave, so they waited till spring and went out with a party of people to kind of clean up the graves that were out there. And this was in more. Um, uh, this this happened in slightly slightly more modern times. It was a few years after, I believe. Um, anyway, they're working on these graves, and they opened up where 
the, the box had been put to kind of get it in there better. And to their surprise, there was a she-wolf with puppies. And she came charging out of this grave at the people who went shrieking back to the town. And now that all sounds like it could be a very easily made up story, and it could have, but I started by looking up um, gene in genealogy and other places, local history records, the names of the people, uh, the name of the people who uh, lost the son, the son's name. I found his regiment and everything, verifying that he was in the Civil War and that he did come back deceased, you know, and, and was buried in a place. And there was another um, set of papers that described more modern happenings where there was the couple, there were two couples um, in a car, and the boys got out of the car because they heard something noisy, and as often happens in, and this sort of thing I call urban legend because um, it's the same actions, it may be different people, different um, unknown animals, whatever, but it's the same set of actions that happens, and you see it all over the country in different places where, with the teenager. That's one of the, the major ones. And they got out of the car to um, hear these, what better what these whistling sounds were, and then they encount started encountering these big, um, shadowy-looking black dogs. And they were supposedly set there by Native Americans long ago to guard their sacred area, which happened to be the Omer Plains. And when the, uh, the people would go away, the dogs would too. There was a little additional one where um, two of these young men were said to have vanished when um, they went out to look for the witchy wolf or these, these howling dogs that were guarding their sacred areas. They just disappeared, and the only thing that was ever found of them um, was one of them had a belt buckle with his initials on it. Oh, jeez. And that was supposed to be the only thing. And I did find people with these family names there. And in such a small community, it's un unless it was well known that one person was playing a joke on all the people in town, it's hard to imagine that you could get away with um, having this publication talking about all these specific people. And I even checked their occupations, George. They had, you know, one, one was listed as an undertaker, one was listed as a grocer. And so there was kind of a lot to, to go on in, in terms of searching them out. But... Um, it's really hard to separate in this case the fact from the fiction. It, well, it, it it is. Yet you have to look at uh, who was involved, and so far everything seems credible, doesn't it? Well, the people do. Yeah, um, I I didn't find any real answer as to who wrote the the historic papers, however. Um, and in fact, when in in the signing of it, it was a little jokey sounding. I can't remember exactly what they said. But um, to have this entire saga reaching from the Civil War to present day, and there are still teenagers going out to that area, you know, and, and parking and to see what's out there. So um, it really has gone a long way and, and still um, it seems to be added to. And um, I'm kind of keeping an eye on it to see if there are other stages that it evolves into. Now, what are dire dogs? Seems to have a lot of dog stories and wolf stories, but what are dire dogs? Yeah, um, dire dog is a name that I came up with. We're used to hearing the term dire wolf because those were real animals that went extinct maybe 10,000 years ago, something like that. And uh, anybody familiar with the Game of Thrones TV show on HBO, um, some of the, the main mythical characters on that show were these were dire dogs. They were larger than wolves, and uh, they played a big part in in the plot. All all of the uh, the the young people of the North each had their own dire wolf and stayed with them for life. Well, um, the dire the actual dire wolf, and we have like I said, thousands of uh, skeletons of these things, um, especially in in Southern California. There are quite a few, and they were very widespread. They were maybe twenty five percent larger than today's tim largest timber wolves at most. They weren't even all that much bigger, but they were constructed differently. They had very wide heads, and they had these very wide jaws so that they could crunch bone. And ever since people started re uh, reporting the Beast of Bray Road to me, um, they all different ones were also sending me 
encounter stories of these very large animals that were canine, but they had broad heads, they had large teeth, some of them even had hyena-like ruffs on their neck, and they didn't, for the most part, go on their hind legs. So to me, um, I, I couldn't really categorize them as dog men because that was the the main thing about dog men. In uh, in Arizona, the Navajo people have something called the chindi. What is that? The chindi is sort of a, a it's actually a really terrifying creature. Um, it's sort of a spirit thing, and it can also change shape, shape shift. But they're believed to carry. Um, let's say that you have lived a less than exemplary life, and you have a lot of bad things or emotions that built up, they will take all that pent-up emotion um, when a person dies and go about the countryside kind of using it to inflict other woes upon other people. And um, it's it varies a little from tribe to tribe. That's generally it. But very often it takes the form of a very large upright cat figure, like a, a mountain lion. Is is this uh, is it a myth or is there something to this? Because you know some some ancients uh, uh, or Native Americans have created shamanic uh, animals to scare their kids and things like that into being good people. Right, that's true. And this seems one that um, I, it seems you almost have to be one of the tribal people in order to experience it, and they're really terrified of it because it. You know, people have all sorts of, of psychological problems and, and actually some physical hurt sometimes from it. But um, it's something that's not very well known out, outside of their stories. I just just happened to cross it somewhere. You've seen your own Bigfoot creature several times out that way, haven't you? I did, yeah. It, in the year 2014, I saw what looked like um, maybe a slightly shorter than usual, uh, like a, a juvenile size, um, soft black colored with, with the round type of head. It didn't have the big uh, crest on its head um, that the older, larger ones have. In, uh, within a mile of each other in different fields, and each time it was doing something else, it was daylight. I was just walking uh, in one instance, the other two. One I was driving, the other my husband was driving. And... Um, in all three of these cases, I could not possibly, it wasn't that far away either. It wasn't like it's just a black blob in the distance. I saw features, not the face, because the sun was behind it, and I couldn't see the face. But um, otherwise, enough to convince me that it was the same thing. It was not a bear. It was way too large to be a black bear or any size dog or anything like that. And I had a good enough look at it that um, I just can't come to any other conclusion. Um, I I did want to mention, if you don't mind, the dire dogs are really different than these other things because they have a big impact, literally, um, often on people's cars. They're described as the size of a mini horse or a small uh, pony or um, any other, a large farm animal like a a, a bull calf. Mm -hmm. They're very large. Usually they're reported as their shoulders coming up to where the, the top of the driver's side door is or the hood of the car or truck, and they're not afraid to to ride at a pace with the car or the truck and then ram into them. I've had one where they actually got Jeez. one down into a ditch. Luckily, the people were able to just kind of keep going and get out of the ditch and, and uh, escape it that way, but um, they seem to have more reality and more aggressiveness than these any, many of these other things. that Are, more are, are they trying to get the people in the car? That's the feeling that the people have, you know, that it, it wants to somehow get their car pulled over where it can get at them better. And uh, they're so uniform in their descriptions of the size and the looks of these things, and they have that sort of primitive look with the, the ruffs around the back of their necks and shoulders, those big, wide heads and the big um, teeth that you see in, in the older model canines. That's uh, kind of a scary thing. and But these run on fours, right? They run on all fours, and they're seen all over the place. It's not just a Wisconsin thing, although I do have a, a bunch of them from Wisconsin, and I've got a number of different encounters told about in the book. But um, 
people get very, very frightened because they perceive that this thing is focused on them. It's not just running across the road trying to get away. It's focused on them and their car, and they just wonder what would happen if they did. One woman even uh, had, with her dog was walking through a Milwaukee park and ran into one, and it was uh, it didn't chase them, but she felt that they were just this close to that happening. It was it watching them very, very intently, just something that looked like a dog, it, she could see it very plainly, but was just way too big to be one. Who is Stephen Stanek? Stephen Stanek is a former newspaper editor and writer for a newspaper in a Wisconsin t- town called Hillsboro in the western section of the state. It's a very weird part of the state, George, because it's called the Driftless Area because the glacier, the last glacier, it sort of smoothed out all the cornfields and things, never touched this. It looks, when you're there, it's about an 18-mile radius. It looks like you're somewhere in Montana with rocky bluffs and deep valleys. And the thing is, over the past several decades, Steve Stanek started gathering reports of mountain lions about uh, several decades ago, and he's up to well over 150 reports just in this 18-mile radius. And the weird thing is, over half of these creatures are not the usual tan and black. Excuse me, tan, tan and white. They're they're black creatures, which um, the locals call black panthers, for lack of a better word. But they're not supposed to be possible. It's not supposed to be possible that mountain lions can be what they call melanistic or black furred. And yet, all of these people are seeing them many times in daylight. There's a huge Amish population. Many of them have reported these things to him. They're out in their fields a lot of the time on foot because they don't use tractors. Um, other people who are uh, hunters, different types of farmers, even right in town. The last one that we had was early March of this year, and uh, one of the barbers in town um, was on his back porch and saw what appeared to be a black panther only about 20 feet away from him. So he was quite sure of the size. And, again, it was daylight, and it just nonchalantly walked at a brisk pace through his yard and went into another yard, and then he found out that one of his his next-door neighbor had had two sightings of this thing. So it's like, what is going on in this small area in Wisconsin that we have all these sightings, When and the DNR denies it. Yeah. They deny it? Why? Well, that's that's the big question. Um, people will say, and that I've had more people regarding this particular phenomenon say, I know what I saw. They tried to tell me I didn't see it. Um, there are possible uh, monetary problems. If, if, if you declare something a breeding population, then um, it becomes something you have to create programs for, and, you know, it can cost quite a bit of money. Maybe that's part of it. Um, they also have extremely strict, they, they won't count a sighting unless it's one of their trained people who sees it, or they have um, a very, very um, good samples of droppings or something like that that they can get DNA from. And if they don't believe that there's enough chance that it was from one, they won't even try the DNA sample. So it has a lot of people, you know, kind of upset because they're being told, no, you didn't see what you saw. You saw something else. You saw a house cat or a beaver or a skunk or something. And people are incensed because mountain lions can get up to six to seven feet long. And people say, I certainly know what a mountain lion looks like. One of the witnesses has several PhDs and was one of the staff people that helped run the Florida Panther Project, which brought um, large, pumped-up, very healthy um, mountain lions into Florida to help beef up their population there. And she's one who saw one of these things in perfect daylight right in front of her truck. She stopped and watched it walk through, and she said, I, you know, she saw so many um, panthers and mountain lions that she can tell what she's seeing. Okay, let's go to the phones. Wayne is truck driving in Kentucky to get us started. Hi, Wayne. Go ahead. Hey, hello. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. I, um, I have this 45-year-old memory of this instance Um it actually, I, I lived uh, about a mile from Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Terraborn. But I had this memory. I was about four to five years old, and there was this shadow man, and he was also a hat man. Um, I was outside playing uh, around the house, and the window box, 
around the basement window from the shoulders up, and this was in the middle, this was daytime. He's, you know, I'm running around, and there's this hat man, shadow man, down in the window box by the basement window, and I don't remember what he, what he said to me, but I have this impression burned into my memory of, of the experience. And, you know, the only thing I can think is, you know, like it was ominous, dark, foreboding thing to, like, keep, sure. me, on the straight and nar- keep me on the straight and narrow to make me live a good life or something, because... You know, I'm not a I'm I'm not a Christian. I'm not a you know, I you know I don't believe in hell, so I don't think it was the devil or anything like that. But how old you know, were you, Wayne? I would have been four to five years old because I don't think I had even gotten into kindergarten yet. But you know the the Jack Earl uh, Haley character from the Watchmen movie. Yeah. Um, it was kind of like that. We know. All right, is- Linda. Let's bring you in on this. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that you were that age because, for some reason, uh, children do seem to be the ones who see these creatures just as much as the adults, if not more. And I have another um, similar story from a boy who was about the same age that you were um, who saw one come into his bedroom and was at the end of his bed and went screaming and told his mother, and, and she believed him because he described such a... Um, detailed thing but it was it was terrifying to him you don't sound like this thing really terrified you so much at the time or am i am i hearing that wrong but the the age fits perfectly it's very often children who see these things were you scared at all wayne it hit me to the core of i mean just talking about it right now i can it's it's deep-seated in the core of my of my body you know it's just giving giving me those chills just remembering it and actually talking you, about you it. You sound more scared now than when you were four. Am I right? I might, I, I might be. I don't know. But it's, yeah, I would think it was like an interdimensional thing or something because, uh, you know, it's just that. It, it kind of, you know, it looked like that, uh, like an outline of Dick Tracy or, or that uh, Jack Earl Harrell, uh, Haley character. But. And Slender Man, uh, Linda, w- would have been around during that era, right? No, not Slender Man, but... Um... Hat Man? The, the Hat Same. Man seems to date back at, at least that far. And I, I do get reports from the Hat Man. And some people take it for just a, a, a black ghost figure. Um, you know, people just are unsure of what it can be, just like this gentleman, because it's something kind of unfamiliar. Indeed. Wayne, thanks for that story. Appreciate it. It's great to have that kind of memory at four years old, too. East of the Rockies, Luke in St. Charles, Missouri. Hey, Luke, go ahead. Uh, hey, Lori. Um, so I uh, I want to relate a couple stories here. The first All right. one was uh, when I was a small child, about three or four, that would have been about 83 or 84, respectively. I was living in Tacoma, Washington, and I was wandering outside, and I seen like a whole crowd of people outside a neighbor's house looking in like a side window. So I walked in, uh, you know, I walked around to see what they was looking at, and I uh, saw what I believe to this day uh, looked like some kind of a tiger man sitting at a desk, you know, kind of casually smoking a cigarette. Jeez. Mm. Yeah. A tiger man. Would we cost him, Linda, or something real? Well, uh, uh, did it did it look like it had any sort of a costume on it? To, to I'm talking to the to the witness. Or could you explain a little more? Why did he seem a tiger man? What features were man, and what features were tiger? Uh, the the face, and it seemed to like have very short fur. It was I don't know. Had like a tiger like pattern on it. And it also had, uh, like, claws at the ends of the fingertips. Um, and, and, Luke, you said other people were looking in on this thing, too. Did they seem uh, in awe or something like that? Oh, yeah. They were fascinated. Um, so that's that's the first story I got to relate. And then wow. uh, when I was a little older, uh, maybe about seven, I was uh, living in Illinois at that time, and I was walking through this old field, you know, because I saw something on the horizon that I wanted to get a closer look at, and I'm walking that way, and then I stumble across these tracks, 
you know, in the in the dirt where, you know, it had like rained like a couple days before that. And that's when I think the tracks were put there because they, they were very, very deep. And uh, the, the front part of the track looked distinctly dog-like. I mean, but the with the pads and the, and the claw marks and everything. But then the, the back part of the track seemed to have, like, the curve of, like, uh, the arch of a foot and then, like, a, a diminished heel that wasn't quite as deep as the, uh, the rest of the footprint. And I... Uh, I've seen those prints. As far as I know, and, and it just disappears. And then I thought that was weird, so I tried to backtrack it, and I backtracked it as far... You know, as I could go there, only about, like, 40 feet, and it also just disappears. Like, it starts out of nowhere and ends in nowhere. And you said you saw feet like that, Linda? I, yeah, I, I know exactly what he's talking about. This was uh, on East Fitzsimmons Road, um, just right on the edge of Milwaukee, where several people had a, very, a large dog man jump jump out of a field at them as they were walking. It, it runs right down to Lake Michigan, and they were just having kind of a nighttime walk. It's not lit by streetlights or anything. And I went there. I was able to go within a couple of days and found pretty much exactly what you found. There was an area of uh, mud where it had rained and then hardened, and I have really good pictures that I took of it. I even sent them to the DNR. But it had a large toe pads with claws, and then the, the back print. And the way that that's actually ma- made is they um, are usually walking on their um, their toe pads, but then when they want to spring at something, go after a deer or something like that, and there were deer prints here. And I could see where the deer had dug in and sprung out, and then this creature had leaned back to get the, um, the right angle so he could, or, or she, whatever it was, could jump out too. And then they, it was like it was chasing the deer for a little bit. And then um, it just sort of stopped. There was a big tussle mark and some grass, I think, which stopped that one. But I've, other people have also reported seeing different kinds of prints that just stop and start in the middle of nowhere. I had that happen right in the middle of a snow field a couple of years ago on um, a, a farm where I've been helping them try and figure out what's going on in their property. What would you say is the strangest creature that has come your way in terms of uh, stories? Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> you know, it has to be, people have started reporting this, what they call a cat dog or a dog cat. And, you know, I just, I can't find any cor- early correlation for that. They they say it has a face that reminds them of a cat, but it's got the build of a dog and usually it's on its hind legs. And again, um, this is sort of a California or southwestern or southern state uh, thing more than than other parts of the U.S. for some reason where people are are reporting it, and that that is just sort of baffling to me, you know, because really nothing about this makes sense, and yet they meet it right out in full day, daylight on the trail, and then many times they'll feel it's following them after that. You make a little reference to Art Bell as well. You had one of the callers years ago, Linda, that must have called you, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's wonderful. The, the things people call in to these shows are just fantastic. Oh, it's, 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 you, you could write books based on the calls. Totally. Oh, yes. You should do hey, that. Is, is <laughs> it, well, that's not a bad idea coming in. Of of all the monsters that you've heard about, of all the monsters you've heard about, which one for you remains the most perplexing? Um, actually, I I would have to say Bigfoot, because he's so hmm. much more there than almost any of the other unknown creatures. Really, there are lots and lots of Bigfoot sightings, and he is so close to human in his appearance and behaviors, and yet not human. So, um, you know, something that that is just so close to so many people, and there are so many sightings of it, and yet we don't have physical proof that we can put forward that we know of, um, just, it just makes it almost maddening. It's like so, so, so close yet so far. 
And are there still sightings, for example, of the Beast of Bray Road, this creature still running around out there? Uh, yeah, there actually are um, sightings of wolf-like creatures, but there are lots of other things that um, are equally as frightening. Um, there are strange, unexplained lights and people seeing sets of red eyes going through the, the tall brushes and um, just you know, a, a whole bunch of other phenomena. Let's go to Eric, truck driving in Indiana to get this segment rolling. Hello, Eric. George! <laughs> my ears, Eric, my ears. It, it, I, did, I tried to tone it down, George. You know All who this right. is. This is All Eric, right. the mind control guy. Anyway, uh, before I get to my question, I'd like to thank you, your staff, and everybody listening that came to work tonight. You're good Americans. And uh, next thing I'd like to know... Uh, I didn't know if the the good lady has ever maybe gotten together with uh, another crypto researcher, uh, Lyle Blackburn, and maybe uh, did a team effort. And the sec- the, my main question is, with my background, George, I have memories that I wouldn't wish on anybody. And with that said, I would like to know if the good lady has ever stumbled on to the fact, or maybe however you want to put it, are some of these creatures, not Bigfoot, he's been around for, you know, as many centuries as anybody can remember, but the more recent ones like the Beast of Bray Road, Lizard Man, and uh, all these other different creatures, is it very, very possible that some of these obscure creatures that have been popping up in the last 80 years were actually created in a lab and and either released or escaped. Take that one first, Linda. What do you think? Well, um, you know, you can't deny that we are on the verge of amazing laboratory methods to change um, not just creatures but but life itself in, in some ways. We can go in and we know the whole genome of so many animals um, and, of course, humans, that we can slice and dice. They have this new method called CRISPR where they can, you know, move around the DNA portions and we can turn them on, turn, turn certain traits on and off, like flash, like clicking a light back on and off. So, um, and I, I also have this credo that if it's possible, if it seems possible to be done, if people have completed enough work to do something and a human um, wants to do something like this and has the means somewhere, it will be done. You know, We may think that head transplants are something far off in the future, but I quote um, a Russian scientist who, who as of uh, this 2017, which is only two years ago, claimed that he could do it and uh, was just kind of waiting to get permission. But there are lots of places in the world where people don't necessarily follow the same ethics we do, or who knows if we actually are. There are many closed laboratories where other sorts of things are going on. So I would never say never. I think there's a little bit too much quickness to jump to that explanation when somebody finds a kangaroo that... um, has been drowned and the fur is is removed and its um, features features have been contorted and changed a little bit by the water erosion and and, uh, other fishes that may be uh, coming in to to eat it or whatever. They they usually look very different after they've been through that process. But um, as far as things being done in a lab, it's hard to say no because um, I, I believe that we in, in most countries are far more advanced than the general population is allowed to find out. The, the, the uh, island of Dr. Moreau, huh? <laughs> well, I don't know if I'd go. But the, the trouble you is never that, know. <laughs> at least that was a confined space, you know. We're talking about pretty much global. And he wanted to know if you know crypto uh, Lyle Blackburn by any chance. I do. I count Lyle as a good friend, and we've collaborated on some things in uh, each other's books, and uh, he's, he's a great guy. Do you know Lauren Coleman by any chance? I do. I do. I've met Lauren several times. I was a speaker. Great crypto guy. At his, yeah, at his annual conference, and uh, have, have met and, and chatted with him in person uh, numerous times. Let's go to Wayne in Tacoma, Washington. Hi, Wayne. 
Good morning, Sir George. Um, Hi there. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you just mentioned uh, the animals or head transplants. I read years ago about a monkey that had a head transplant, and uh, they were able to keep it alive for I don't know how many hours, and mm-hmm. that eye movement and mouth movement and that. But with the technology, I don't know. I think it was 15 or 20 years ago they weren't able to keep it alive for a long time. Um, yeah, about 19 mid to late 1980s. My wife, and my, uh, and myself, and my family would always go to kids' camp uh, up near Blue Lake, uh, Camp Davidson, and uh, we'd do counseling or night watch. And I was on night watch this one week uh, between midnight and 8 in the morning, uh, and I'd go out every uh, uh, half an hour or so and do a round around the camp. And uh, I went out to the far extent of the camp on a dirt road, uh, by where all the kids' cabins were in that, and uh, it was coming back and uh, had my mag uh, a light flashlight with me, uh, carry a sidearm, uh, concealed weapon, just like you do, George. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I heard a noise up in the woods. <clears throat> so I aimed my flashlight up in the woods, and, uh, you know, I saw two black forms and uh, took a second for my eyes to adjust but uh, right away you know from those black forms i saw brilliant flashing orange eyes and then you know i was expecting to see you know white fur but no it was black fur two leopards in uh near bend or you know black lakes near bend or uh, the lake is near bend blue lake is near bend oregon not too far from bend oregon and that's kind of an unusual area, I think, for panthers to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and I, I just slowly kept my light on them and slowly backed out for about 150 to 200 feet, slowly turned around and slowly walked away, you know, got back to the camp headquarters where everybody, you know, meets and sits and has coffee and their donuts and stuff. And, uh, you know, I sat down and had my coffee and, and told the people about it. And they just kind of, you know, oh, sure, you know, and they couldn't believe it. And uh, I was embarrassed to call the forest ranger. <laughs> uh, and thinking back huh. about it, I probably should have. Did you say, I know what I saw? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, well, you know, that's there was a time thing. before the 1900s decimation of most of the big cats or uh, enforcing them westward when uh, jaguars, and mountain lions roamed all over the United States, uh, uh, southern Canada, and down into, uh, you know, Mesoamerica. So the fact that, you know, I also think that animals are more resilient than we know, and that they find a way to survive even when they think they've totally left the place, and that uh, mountain lions are so elusive that even scientists call them ghost cats. So um, it, it doesn't surprise me that you saw some there, other than the fact that most people just don't ever get to see them. They can be three feet away from you, and, and you, you're not seeing them because they just blend in so well. Absolutely. Let's go to Lindsay in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Hi, Lindsay. Hello. Hi there. Hey, Hi. George. Hey, Linda. Hi. Great, great show. Thank you. Yes. Um, I would... Love to invite you both to dinner over here on the East Coast sometime. What's for dinner? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I know time is running out, but you're just going to have to let me know what you like, and then I'll figure something out. But no, no roadkill. All right. Uh, uh, roadkill, um, maybe it could <laughs> be. Uh, you never know. You never know right. around here. All right, <laughs> go ahead, Linz. Yeah. Anyway, I, you know I love the title of Linda's book, and I thank you. Let me let me know where to get it from and when, and is it Amazon or what? But um, before you let us know about that, I just want to let you know that in a small town nestled in the Appalachian Mountains, back in the mid '60s, I encountered a creature. What was it? Uh, you can guess if you want. A it Bigfoot? I would, I would guess a Bigfoot. Well, no, ahead. I don't, I don't want to call him Bigfoot. 
uh, more like the white one. Like the Yeti? Yeah, yes. Abominable That's snowman. Abominable snowman. In in mm-hmm. your neck of the woods? Um, actually, uh, you know, when you have a dream, um, it's soon forgotten. And I was five, maybe, four, five, six, maybe. Young age again, yeah. Um, I, I'll never forget it. <clears throat> um, you know, uh, people that I have confronted, you know, uh, they, oh, it was just a dream. But you, how could you forget something that you know you saw vividly? I mean, this was vivid. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Light, or was it like a um, light, silvery mix of, of hair? It, it was bright white, uh, uh, uh 20 feet away or less, uh, beautiful eyes. Um, I wasn't scared. I was just intrigued. It was just like, well, what is that thing? There's a pattern here, too, Linda, with young people in their four-, five-, six-year-old ages seeing these creatures. Right, right. And they seem, I, I don't know if it's because children are just looking more, um, their, their eyes are, are, are good, and, and they're looking in, in their, at their surroundings and open and fresh. Um, or is it that we are born without a filter on this other world, and as we get older, we can see less and less, but when we're younger, and it's the same thing as uh, dogs and cats have. If you've ever had a dog or your cat sitting staring in the corner and, and growling at something that isn't there, that we that we think is not there, at least. Right, we think is not there, exactly. So uh, it's not at all unusual for people to write me and say, "I saw this when I was six, ten, you know, eleven, um, fourteen, and I remember it just like it was yesterday." And uh, you go down and see Lindsay first and uh, see how she cooks, okay? <laughs> All right, yeah, and I'll, I'll put in a request for no road kills. <laughs> You'll be the guinea pig, Linda. <laughs> exactly, as long as we aren't eating guinea pig. Mention your websites, which are, and you're on Facebook and Twitter as well, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And people, uh, go ahead. My my uh, main blog is lindagodfrey.com, and you can really find everything else right there. Super, and we've got that linked up at coasttocoastam.com as well. Yes, Linda, th- Thank you, my dear, for being on the program. Keep in touch with us, okay? Thank you so much for having me, and thanks to all of your listeners as well. If you want to listen to our show ad-free, 24-7, access audio archives, live chat with me, and much more, you need to become a Coast Insider now. So you're telling me your grandmother, who died a few weeks ago, came and visited you last night in your bedroom, and you're not scared? Are extraterrestrials living among us? I don't know if it's true or not, folks, but we're going to find out. If you enjoy stories like these and want to learn more about the mysteries of the universe with me, become a Coast Insider now to access hundreds of our archived shows to listen anytime, anywhere. Sign up now at coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider. That's coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider.